cooked well or cooked by someone that knows how to cook them. And I think that you have to, you know, understand what function they have in the animal in order to cook them properly. And that's back to where we talked about the muscle structure and how it works and how it functions for the animal. Obviously, the tenderloin, you know, is a lot softer. The muscle doesn't move as much as opposed to the leg or the shoulder, which bears a lot of the weight from the animal. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the other thing with, with innards is that they're much more volatile. John talked about them freezing them. They, a lot of times, are frozen because of bacteria growth and uh, you know shipping and stuff like that. And it, it's something that the USDA has kind of pushed them into a corner on. You know, you got to kind of try to get almost all of your innards are frozen before they come to us. Um, not every single thing, but a lot of them. And a lot of things are IQF, which is instant quick freeze, which is a lot better actually because it's frozen so rapidly that even if you got it fresh, it probably still wouldn't be as fresh as the defrosted product. Um, and then some people believe that that defro or freezing the product actually helps to tenderize it. Um, we've actually noticed this with octopus. Um, we've gotten a range of octopus from all over the world, uh, local waters, Spanish waters, Mediterranean waters. Um, and the one that we found to be the best for us um, was actually a frozen product. Um, and it became the most tender. We usually use it, we comfy it. Um, so we cook it, we don't comfy it in animal fat, we comfy it in olive oil. Um, so the exchange from the liquid, you know, releasing from the actual octopus and the olive oil going in as it's cooking or as it's cooling, um, we noticed was the best product that we could get our hands on. Um, Which, it, to me, I think is one of the, we'll take the question one second, is one of the most important things about cooking. Every person's palate in this room is different. What you might like, he might not like, you know, and vice versa. So what we did today to set up a little experiment here in the house is we actually took a cut of meat that's a very common cut of meat, which is a short rib, and we actually braised some in liquid, and then we also circulated it, which that's what's going on in the back of the room there. So you could have two cuts of meat. We didn't want to set off any fire alarms, or else we would have done like some grilled stuff and a bunch of other things. But basically, what we wanted to do is give you guys a little taste, so you could see in your palate, and you could pick what you choose as your favorite way of braising or circulating or. I'm sure you guys all, a lot of people got excited about Korean barbecue. I'm sure you had a grill. <laughs> so we'll, you know, we're going to go ahead and get that passed out as well. Um, Hold on, he had a question. Go ahead. Uh, I was just wondering if that octopus was IQF or traditionally frozen. It was IQF. IQF. It's IQF. A lot of the things that come to you that are frozen are usually IQF. It's kind of like the standard practice nowadays. Um, I had, Can I, you say a little bit more about IQF for those who might not be? It's instant quick freeze. They put them in these like giant blast freezers, and they they, they have them on boats actually yeah. too now. Um, and they they freeze the product before it even hits the ground. You drop it in, it's frozen. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> unbelievable. So, <laughs> so this will change. That is, uh, is this is Mike. He's our chef de cuisine. It freezes so fast, the molecules don't have the chance to really grow. So it kind of like sometimes you got made like it's been frozen improperly cool it, uh, not as fast. The meat seeps a lot, so like it has a really flaccid look to it. When you freeze it right or like IQF style, then it has the chance of uh, staying intact as the meat, like it was more firm uh, right from the beginning. And that's why And it gives it. zero time to allow bacteria to grow, you know, which right. is obviously in the United States the way that we have been raised, we are so conscious of even the temperature that will serve pork, you know what I mean? And it's like, when we were in Japan, they were serving us raw chicken, literally slicing it and giving it to a sashimi. And I like, I had, it took a minute because I had it in my mind, the same way probably with the grasshoppers, I had to tell myself like, I'm not gonna die. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just remember, you're not gonna die. There's been probably a million other people that have been in here eating this and didn't die. And then I ate it and it was amazing, you know? And it was like, but obviously here, the way, the way that we raise our chickens, which goes back, you know, there's usually stacked on top of each other and can barely walk because they're bumping into each other. We, we all have seen on food, um, the, the documentary. Uh, 
Um, so the cooking of techniques of, of meat, and this is just kind of scratching the surface, but also hits, hits a lot of things, but you can go deep into each one of these. But grilling, braising, roasting, broiling, sous vide, confit, combination cooking, which can usually steam and roast. You, there, there's these ovens now that, that do this, com combi ovens. Um, frying, pressure cooking, smoking, and pickling. Pickling alone um, and searing, obviously, are lots of ways to and achieve different goals with different cuts of meat. Um, you know, the the short ribs you're about to taste here today, the the circulated ones, um, which were cooked obviously sous vide. We we a lot of times actually take the after they've been in circulation for the proper amount of time, um, we actually fry them in the deep fryer to get a really crispy crust on the outside without overcooking the meat um, in the inside. Uh, because then you're going from this low temperature, you know, consistent constantly for, you know, ours go for 48 hours to then this really hot, high heat. Um, we feel that the crust is achieved the best by deep frying it. Um, Once again, opinion, Dave. Opinion. It's just an opinion. Um, so a couple of the challenges we've come across with some of these things, we, the pig ears that we spoke of earlier, um, when we first got the pig ears in, we didn't, John and I didn't work in any kitchens that, that we worked with pig ears in. We never worked for someone else that cooked pig ears. We never trailed in any kitchens. We didn't know really anything about it. So we knew we liked So part of our menu comes from <laughs> They're delicious. Yeah. 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 It, it comes from curiosity, and we had them. We brought them in, and I had done some reading and some research, and you know, pretty much everything I found was like cook them, you know, six to eight, ten hours, and they should be, you know, palatable. And when they came out, we found that they weren't. They're never as good as the guy that we had in Tennessee's ears. You so know what I mean? His John, ears were always so much better than ours. So John ears. called him up and, and asked him what he did. And he basically told us to let him go for like 24 hours. Yeah. And well, I told him the time, and he called me an idiot. And he goes, "Everybody knows you cook ears for 24 hours." <laughs> <laughs> so, so we found that with that challenge, that we found that that boiling them more and breaking down the protein structure of the ear and the collagen and the actual um, cartilage as well, which seemed to be the hardest part to get by, because the cartilage was like. Really, it was almost like eating bone. Um, we found that by cooking them for this long, we found the best result. Because then we take them and cool them, and then julienne them and fry them. Um, so then they get really crispy, but their texture kind of like shatters in your mouth. Um, our friend Botaggio, Michael Botaggio owns Inc. He swears by the pressure cooker. He cooks his in a pressure cooker in like two hours. But we don't really do any pressure cooking at either one of our restaurants. So um, it's a cooking process that we just haven't taken to. We weren't brought up in any kitchens that people you know, put this upon us. So it hasn't been something we've really explored. Now, we would love for you guys to try to explore the different variables and also possibly use um, different you know, things that will break down the protein. Maybe it's marinating on the things. You know, that's kind of, we want to leave that open for you guys to explore. Um, Another dish, the pigtails that we serve, uh, same kind of situation. Um, we cooked them, uh, we braised them, uh, we, you know, in a traditional French style method. Um, and when pigtails come to you, they literally look like a tail that's, you know, from a pig that's almost like a mini oxtail. And actually, it's believe it or not, the teal being whole like that and curling means that the pig was actually kept in the wild or free range because if you put the pigs in the same cage, they actually eat the other guy's tail. They bite it. Sounds crazy. So if you ever get a tail that looks like a thumb, that's a dirty pig. So you know what I mean? Like so like we we, we pretty much kinda like overthought the pigtail thing. Uh, you know, in general we we tried to so we tried to braise them, we tried to fry them, we tried to just slow roast them, and nothing seemed to be working. Um, and then we decided to confit them. But when we were doing this, we were we were also like taking the tail and we were cutting it down the middle and picking all the spinal cord and the bones out and all this stuff. And it was just pretty much like 
the end result was nothing. We ended up with you know very minuscule amount of, of tail. A lot of work for very little result. So we came back to around that they 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 kind of like when you leave them on the bone, you cut them after we comp feed them and cooled them. They kind of ate like a chicken wing does almost in a sense. So we kind of treated them like that, and that was you know where we came out with a positive result. Um, so it was so we ended up brining them first. Um, in a pretty heavy salt solution um, with a little bit of aromatics, bay leaf and thyme, peppercorns, garlic. Um, and then decided to comb feed them for about eight hours. Um, and then we had our best results by doing that. And I think a lot of it is experimentation, you know, for us, you know, not knowing a lot of the things that we really desire to cook um, and want to have on our menu. Um, the same thing with the heart, back to the heart. like. We never really worked anywhere. We never worked with uh, heart in general, but um, I've eaten it once or twice in my life, um, and I know I want to put it on the menu. I find it to be a very delicious uh, item uh, that comes from, this, like I said, the same cows that we were getting other cuts from. Um, so I think we're on to the tasting. So the like John said, we have we have a like French style, traditional style, like short rib that we've done, which is braised for a few hours, 300 degrees. It's kind of like what you taught in culinary school, basic technique. Um, and then we have another one which we've uh, put in a circulator and uh, good for 48 hours at 56 degrees Celsius. Um, both of them we have used uh, Activa RM, known as meat glue. Um, the plates that come from the more sustainable raised cattle are actually really small. We found out that because the size they're not overfed grain and corn and stuff like that, that they're just a much smaller animal. And the plates that we get literally from an animal that's been corn and grain fed for the, its whole life are about that thick, which is what we have to do by gluing two of these pieces together. So the animal's almost twice the size, so for the farmer or the person raising these cattle, their yield's twice as high. So they make way more money off yeah. one cow. And the circulator's a newer thing for us. We didn't really add it to our repertoire of kick, uh, kitchen cooking tools until a little over a year ago. So we're still playing around with it as well and trying to decide, do we like it better circulated or do we not? And then the other element that the circulator offers, which goes back to the cooks, is it really controls all your food, you know. So, for example, if we put a piece of fish in there, it will hold it at the temperature that we want it to go out. So, all they got to do is open up the bag and put it on the plate, which helps with people from screwing it up. But it also kills a little bit of the intuition, you know, for the cook. And that's something that we were brought up on. You know, we were we were brought up in kitchens where, you know, searing, braising, roasting, these basic essential ways of cooking were really important to the chef that we work for. Um, and now, with so many people trying to cook, it's, the culinary field seems to be rapidly growing. Um, and as we grow as a company, and as we expand, um, we now have two restaurants. We obviously can't be everywhere at a, you know, every moment, as much as we would like to be. Um, we're obviously here right now doing this lecture. Um, you know, the, the, human, the room for human error is huge. And with these types of tools, they've helped us control some of that human error. And, you know, we don't do, you know, sous vide cooking because it's cool. You know, it's not, that's really not why we do it. We do it to try to get our customer the best product as consistently as we possibly can. And, and at the end of the day, flavor is the of most few most of the top of our list. You just know? like they said, you know, like deliciousness is super important. To just us. you know, it's like they, they, you know, no matter how much you try to get something to a customer, if it doesn't taste great, it, there's no point really. Um, so that, and then I had besides the the pig ears for you guys to try out. Amy asked us to come up with a couple other things. Um, just as the myth is with. Uh, searing is locking in the juices. You know that's also become. You know now has become. You know people are saying that this is a myth, and it is. Opposite. <coughs> but I actually had a question. Is something else you're constantly beat over the head with in classic French kitchens is that 
meat is always juicier on the bone. And I, have, I, I would love for you guys to do, you know, some research and tell us if, you know, we haven't had the time to really get into these, some of these projects um, to really find out. Is it really, you know, is a, or all, is a leg of lamb, scientists to do it for us. Is a leg of lamb, you know, just as juicy off the bone as it is on the bone. Um, and then the peeling the eggs and variables. Um, we have had a hell of a time with peeling eggs. Um, we, we use eggs from a farm, uh, a farmer that comes to the farmer's market. We get them every week, we buy a few cases a week. Um, and every week differs um, what our yield is from that case. Um, you know, we, we've tried, you know, we've read Harold McGee and tried the variables of salt and, and uh, everything baking, you know. baking soda in the water, which seemed to help a little bit. And then the shocking, what the temperature is when you shock the egg, actually, um, when it comes out of the, the hot liquid or water. Um, and is it different? If, if, every, if your temperature of water, when you shock it, what when you boil it, what, what do you have actually in the water when you boil it? The eggs, we know the age of the eggs seems to be a variable that, that seems like if the eggs are a little bit older, there's more air underneath the membrane that helps release the shell. Um, but we haven't come to an ultimate conclusion of like, how do we get the best yield? Because we hate to throw away our, you know, humanely raised <laughs> organic farm eggs. So, um, with that, I think we're gonna taste some meat. Anybody have any questions? Can you just comment a little bit more about why the 56 degrees for the, the short ribs in the circulating back? What's special about 56? 56 seemed to give us the best result, really, after we had experimented with 58, 60, 62. <laughs> so the difference is in, like, was it a texture thing? It was a texture and the color. Yeah, the color. The color really was what we were aiming for. Um, we really wanted to treat the short ribs more like a steak because it ate more like a steak. Mm. It eats more like, you know, like you would uh, a ribeye. Rib it has, the fat's not as melted out, the um, the temperature, the look of the meat. Yeah, You'll see it on your plate too, because the one that's going to be circulated is going to look almost Which we like use rare. Well, it's going to look almost raw because we, we usually, like I said, we usually fry them after they come out of the circulation or we would pan sear them. But if we did that in here right now, we would possibly set the alarm off. Yeah, definitely. So. I think, I mean, I, I've burned a walnut actually in here before. So if you wanted to, yeah. I don't, I don't I'm know. I'm not going to take the risk. Okay. Yeah. 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 Let's say everyone wants to shower right now. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, but 56 just seemed to be the right temperature, you know, like 54 takes As well as like, you know, we use a lot of the information that's been provided by guys like them, Nathan, you know, all these books that come out, you, you obviously you go in, you take their information, and then you make your choice. You know, it's like, who's do I like more? Which style? What temperature? What, you know, and then, you know, all because you might specifically like something, can it even be executed in this restaurant? Because our kitchen line, which you've seen, is about the size of this, these two tables. So it's not that big. You know, we cook for at least 120 people a day um, off that line. So it's, you know, it has to be able to be stored there, fit there, work there, not blow all the electricity because you need more electricity to pull it off. So there's a lot of factors. That's been one of the biggest challenges as well is space. You know, like we've, we've, you know, tried our little projects and stuff like that, but we just, you know, when it comes to space and time, they're they're so crucial in the restaurant. You know, we 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 hardly have any extra time, and we hardly have any extra space in the restaurant to try. You know, and in, in, in building it into your your daily routine is is, is a challenge for us. Um, you know, we're constantly challenged by our space and our time. Our so, um, question about the the short ribs. Um, I think you mentioned the. Uh, Frying it afterwards to kind of like get that mild reaction to yeah. create that nice like meaty flavor of uh -huh. caramelized protein. Um, and I was wondering if you guys also, I mean, we've been playing around with it, and um, sometimes it's nice I've noticed to actually like fry sous vide and then fry, or just like sear sous vide and then fry, so that way 
when you're cooking it at like 56 or 62 or whatever for 24 or 48, that way you actually develop like those roasting flavors like inside the bag. Right. The time. I think that that's, it's, it's definitely something that we've tried. And then the other thing that I've actually wondered about that is, does it lower any sort of bacteria potentially growing inside of the bag? Something from not searing the outside of the meat. Because um, we've had bags blow up on us, um, and we couldn't really find the air hole in it at all. You know, like we couldn't find like where the the, the vacuum sealer didn't seal it. So that was another thing that we, you know, we've been trying to figure out as well. Um, it also depends on the cut of meat. You know, sometimes we have a short rib. I feel like it, it's a type of piece of meat, so it can actually uphold like the double searing, like the right. before and after. Whereas if you're doing something like you know, like a hanger or a tenderloin, maybe it's better to just soup it before and then right. sear it after. Because right. then I'll have like, to up hold it like a triple. Yeah. Oh, that's like a triple. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. The multiple. The multiple cooking techniques is definitely like within the same thing. Is something that we definitely tried, but. You know, once again, I mean, you know, you know, our restaurant. You've come in there since the beginning, yeah. and our food and what we've been doing there has evolved, and it constantly is. And we're constantly looking for better ways to do things, and what we feel is better. And I think that, I think that, you know, we just have to constantly look for the moment where we have the time to test those variables out. Um, and. There's a lot of unknowns for us still. A ton, you know. Yeah. 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 So to some people, like the one that's traditionally braised might seem drier. But there's more of an exchange because it's been cooked in liquid. So it releases liquid as well when it's cooking, which you don't get as much in the bag. And then the fattiness too. And the, the fattiness too. Um, the other thing is, is what we've also been, you know, toying around with is the fact that that sometimes we cook some of these things with butter inside the bag, and then the whole butter seems to sometimes take on a different flavor in the bag. Like it almost tastes like farmy, or uh, you know, you can taste the milk solids or whatnot in it. It just it. We haven't, like I said, we just haven't had enough time to really come around to like a final conclusion on these things. But some of these things that we're bringing up, maybe you guys could, you know, do some research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of that you mentioned it because uh, most recently what we've been doing, because um, I've actually I went away from searing sous vide and then searing, oftentimes with short ribs, I'll just like sous vide and then sear it afterwards instead of doing the initial sear. But we really wanted to develop that roasty flavor. So what I typically do is make like a really nice, like sexy brown butter. Like brown the butter really hard with garlic, thyme, rosemary to get that really good herbal infusion, and then put that inside the bag so it's like developing.